started. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited uh, to do this. Uh, just a quick reminder before we get started, I just want to let everybody know that we're recording this session, so we'll be shutting down everyone's audio and video, but you can still participate uh, through the chat function. And at the end of all of this, we'll have a question and answer section where everyone will be free to uh, talk and chat about the work that we've looked at. Um, so just know that that's there. So uh, let's, okay, let's get started. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to Photos at Zoom with the Museum of Contemporary Photography. I'm gonna start my video here so you can see uh, who I am. Uh, so I'm Dylan Yarbrough. Um, I'm a curatorial assistant here at the MOCP, as well as a second year graduate student at Columbia College Chicago in the Photo MFA program. Uh, and today uh, we're gonna be doing a photos at Zoom session about color theory. Um, before we get started, I'd like to do a quick introduction. So uh, the MOCP is the world's premier college art museum dedicated to photography. Um, and our institution provokes ideas among artists and students and diverse communities through groundbreaking exhibitions, as well as educational programming. And our mission is to provide a deeper understanding of cultural and political uh, roles of photography in our world today. So we started uh, collecting uh, photographs in the 1980s, and now we have a collection of over 16,000 photographic objects. Uh, we'd love to show these photos to the public. In fact, it's uh, part of the whole operation of our museum is to make our collection as accessible as possible. And normally we offer an event called Photos at Noon, uh, but obviously because we're all uh, uh, social distancing, we're doing photos at Zoom. Uh, so we wanted to keep our museum viewers inspired uh, with our collection by bringing it to you at home. And so today we'll be doing this Photos at Zoom event uh, talking about color theory. And I don't know about um, everyone here, but looking at art and talking about art is uh, my favorite thing to do. Uh, so this is just really a special occasion uh, that we get to all do that together and talk about some really cool work and then uh, have a discussion about it. So this lecture is gonna be divided into a couple different parts. Uh, basically, we're going to be doing a deep seeing exercise to start off, kind of like an icebreaker. Um, and then we're going to go into the fundamentals of color theory and talk about which uh, photographs specifically illustrate some of these strategies. And then we'll go through a survey of our collection, talking about uh, really awesome photographs that we have uh, that use color in interesting ways. And then lastly, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Yeah, so just checking the chat here. Is everyone seeing everything okay, hearing okay? Seems like one person was having trouble with audio and video. But it looks like most people are doing okay. All right, awesome. All right, so let's get going. So the first thing I wanna do is a deep seeing exercise. And I thought this would just be a really fun way for all of us to get warmed up and also to reflect on why color is so important. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna bring up a slide and we're all gonna stare at that slide for 30 seconds. And try not to look away, like try to just stare at that slide, focusing on your screen, and I'll let you know when the time is up. And once the time is up, look at a blank white wall or uh, close your eyes. Okay, so we're gonna go to that screen now. Okay, so let's all focus on the screen for 30 seconds. I'm gonna start the timer. Okay, so that's about 30 seconds. So take a look at a blank white wall or close your eyes. It may take a couple seconds for it to come in. So what do you see there? Does anybody wanna put in the chat what they're seeing? Okay, so we're seeing some warm colors, red, orange, right? Orange, orange, right? Okay, so all of our eyes are a little bit 
um, different, right? So we have different sensitivities to color, but, and the re results may vary a little bit, but what you should have seen is a faint orange after image. And the reason this is, is because orange is the opposite color of blue. This happens because our eyes simultaneously require complementary color. So if the color is not already present, our brain and eyes are gonna generate it spontaneously. This is called simultaneous contrast. It's a really interesting way to just open up the conversation about color because we perceive color in several different ways. There's the physiological way that our eyes see it. We also have a psychological response to it. Uh, it makes us feel certain things, but then we also have like cultural ties where we experience cer certain colors certain ways because of colors that are in our culture. It's a really interesting little exercise. So now we're going to move along and talk about the fundamentals of color theory. And I think that oftentimes uh, because color is so ingrained in our daily lives that we take it for granted, uh, but it really does have phenomenal effects on us. And it drastically changes the way that people perceive photography as well as other images. So we're gonna go through a little bit of the fundamentals of color theory now. So the deep seeing exercise that we did and many other elements of this lecture are inspired by the ideas of uh, Johann Itten, uh, who was from 1919 to 1922. Uh, he was teaching at the Bauhaus School in Germany and he taught many different courses on color theory. He was initially trained as an educator with an interest in psychoanalytic theory, and he combined his ideas into theories about the relationships between color. These, these ideas became the foundation of his book, The Art of Color, which was then later republished as The Elements of Color. If you're interested in like a deeper dive into some of the subjects that we're gonna talk about today, this is a really great place to start. Um, this book is a bit pricey and can be hard to get, but there's a lot of on online content that discusses the ideas of this book that would help you uh, learn more about it. Okay, so in this book, Iden proposed several different uh, structures for understanding color. He talks about the 12 hue color circle, seven color contrasts, and emotional experience. He was one of the first people to talk about color being experienced emotionally. So we're gonna go through each one of these things and talk about what they mean. Normally in a print viewing, we don't get this deep into like the technical side of photography, but it's hard to talk about color theory or color without understanding some of those basic uh, functions. So to start off, we're gonna talk about the 12 hue color circle. Looking at the 12 hue color circle, allows us to map out how hues function individually and in combination with other hues. And if you're unfamiliar with the word hue, it basically is a more technical way of referring to the name of a pure color. So commonly we just use the color name. So red is a hue, orange is a hue, and so on. Uh, there are several ways that the 12 hues can be combined uh, to create a color scheme. And that includes primary color, secondary color, tertiary color, complementary, analogous, warm, and cool. And we're gonna talk about each one of those schemes and then look at photographs that illustrate them. But before we do that, let's just take a look at this diagram that Iden included in his book, The Art of Color. Uh, so he's calling this the Delacroix. And what's interesting is we see the color circle that we're really used to seeing, right? That goes all the way back to like primary school when we're thinking about Roy G. Biv and Sir Isaac Newton and the colors that we can see as humans. Uh, but what he did here is he added this section in the middle that makes it really easy to understand the color relationships. So if you look here in the center, there's a triangle with yellow, red, and blue. And then outside of that triangle, we see a hexagon with purple, orange, and green. The reason this is, is because inside the triangle, we have primary colors, which then create the secondary colors and then that goes on to create every other color that is registered on the 12 hue color circle. I like this design because it actually points to the color on the wheel. So if you notice that the yellow is actually pointing towards yellow, orange is pointing towards orange, and then in the negative space between the circle and the hexagon, we see this white space and that's aligned with the color that's in between, which in this case is red-orange, the tertiary color. 
So we're gonna go through each one of these individually and I'm gonna to try to provide resources that help you uh, wrap your brain around it. I know that some of us are gonna be very adept at color and this is probably just a review because we have some of the artists that are actually in this presentation watching and I know that they have a really great grasp on color. And for some of us, it's just good to go over some of the basics. Um, so let's move along here. So we're gonna start with primary color. So like we were saying, primary color, which is red, yellow, or blue, is a color that cannot be made from a combination of other colors. So all other colors are made by mixing these three primary colors. A really great example of primary color in a photograph is in this image by uh, Hires and Mabane, a sun sunbeam bread uh, from 2006. And it's really just a perfect example mainly because the sunbeam packaging is using red, yellow, and blue. Uh, but it brings up the, the question of like, what colors are used in branding overall. And I think that red and yellow come up quite often. Like if you think about fast food restaurants, uh, we typically see the food industry or anywhere that's using a quickly paced model to produce food uh, using red and yellow. So that's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, but in this image, uh, we see like, again, this great primary color palette. Uh, these artists are New York based uh, collaborative. They work together and they inter interrogate contemporary material culture and they're interested in how objects can hold a sentimental feeling. And uh, this work is all in a project called Empire. And so in this project, they take several road trips throughout the American South and the West and their images focus on the interiors of homes and workplaces using found objects as poetic indicators of not only their occupants' dreams and circumstances, but also the United States as a whole. In total, this project actually uh, consists of 9,000 photographs, which is really cool and uh, pretty impressive. Um, and each edit of that 9,000 photographs is done in a different way, and it varies throughout their installation to provide a unique perspective of American life and values. It's a really great example here. And just as a reminder, I'm gonna bring up the color circle for each photograph to help show you where that falls. So again, we have our primary colors, the red, yellow, and the blue. So now we're gonna talk about secondary color, which is purple, green, and orange. And these are created from the combination of two primary colors. So for example, blue and yellow make green. A really wonderful example of a secondary color palette in a photograph is this uh, image, Isolated Building Study, number 24, by David Shaliol, made in 2008. It's really great because if you notice in the background, the sky is purple, and then in the foreground, we see that a street lamp is casting green onto uh, the house, but also the sidewalk. And then when you look in the background, we have like a very faint orange uh, in the street lamps that is lighting up these industrial objects. Um, someone's saying that I uh, literally have this book on my desk right now. That's awesome, Jonathan. It's a really, really amazing series. Um, if you don't know about this work, um, basically what we're looking at is David Shaliol uh, is photographing vacant residential structures. Um, he's a sociologist and a photographer questioning the ever-changing uh, urban landscape as it relates to larger issues like race and class inequities. Uh, he produced a feature-length film in 2018 called The Area, which follows a, a community activist named Deborah Payne. And in this film, Deborah was fighting a multi-billion dollar company uh, that was on a quest to buy and demolish over 400 homes that were owned by African-American families in the Chicago neighborhood of Inglewood. Uh, so this film's really important to a very local cause uh, here in Chicago. And so that film is called The Area, 2018. And so this film is paired with Shalio's images of lone buildings centered between vacant lots, uh, appearing as more of a shrine to a disappearing neighborhood. Shalio says that instead of seeing one peculiar building, we see the legacy and immediacy of urban transformation. And instead of asking what happened to this house, we ask what is causing this phenomenon? So to get, to get back onto the idea of color, we can see again here, 
just looking at this chart, we have some orange in the background. Uh, it's a very desaturated and kind of nuanced orange, but it's there. And then we see the purple in the sky and then the green in the foreground. So now we're gonna move on to tertiary color. And tertiary color is basically the colors that are left over from primary and secondary on the wheel. Uh, this, this one's kind of interesting. So, you know, it was a, it was a really cool uh, challenge for me to go through our online collection and trying to find an image that fits each one of these color schemes. And some of them were fairly easy, like primary or secondary, but tertiary was a little interesting. I don't think uh, many photographers set up their camera and they're like, man, I'm really gonna get that tertiary color today. Um, but uh, the other thing too is like tertiary color is probably evident in most photographs since photographs are a gradation of color. Um, so it was difficult to find an image, but I think this one is pretty good. Uh, tertiary colors are combinations of primary and secondary color. Uh, there are six tertiary colors, red orange, yellow orange, yellow green, blue green, blue violet, and red violet. An easy way to remember these names is to place the primary color name before the other color names. So if the color is blue and green, you would call it blue green and not green blue, just remembering that primary color. So to illustrate tertiary color, I went with this image. I don't know if it's exactly perfect, but it's pretty close. Uh, so in the background, we see a little bit of blue green on this book. And then we see a little red orange here on the desk and then the shadows of this figure on her dress. We can see a little bit of red purple as well as some magenta. And I think that that's as close as we're gonna get to illustrating tertiary color, um, but I think it does a pretty good job. So to bring up again, uh, this color wheel to try to help explain. Uh, so we have our yellow, red, and blue, which is our primary. And then we have green, orange and purple, which is our secondary colors. And then tertiary colors are everything in between. So we have the yellow green here, we have the yellow orange, we have the red orange, we have red purple, and then we have blue purple. So now we're gonna move on to complementary color. Complementary color is at the heart of color theory, and we experienced why that is earlier, because our eyes are always trying to simultaneously produce the complement of every color that we're looking at. It's really fascinating. But in the most basic form, uh, a complementary color is a hue uh, that opposes another hue on the color wheel. So an image to illustrate that is by Eric Johnson. Uh, this image untitled number 13, the red sweater tied to brown shirt. Um, it's pretty obvious, I think, in this image what's going on. We see the, the red sweater in the middle and then it's circled by this really lush green forest around it. So that red and green is creating the complementary uh, color palette. And uh, again, to illustrate, um, Complementary colors oppose each other on the wheel. So in this case, we're looking at red, which is the direct opposite of green. Complementary is pretty easy to remember. So then we'll talk about analogous color. Analogous colors are a group of at least three colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. Um, in this example, uh, we see quite a few warm colors put together. So this is uh, wallpapered by Patty Carroll uh, from 2017. And you can see just a wonderful gradient between yellow and yellow green and yellow orange, and then a little bit of orange. And then in very small places, you can kind of see a desaturated red, uh, like in the flowers. So this series is really great. Um, this image is from Carol's Anonymous Women series. Uh, so she creates photographs, colorfully constructed uh, installations to humorously consider uh, gender-based and domestic roles. Uh, so she features a headless and anonymous mannequin uh, that is amongst this abundance of carefully arranged domestic uh, objects. Uh, and then we'll see that the figure is nearly completely um, unseen or anonymous because of these objects hiding it in the, inside the environment. And then so Carol is asking us to consider uh, and reflect on how our constructed identities are shaped by the culture of consumerism and these household objects. 
So then to talk about analogous, analogous color as it falls on the color wheel, basically, like we were saying, it's when three or more colors sit side by side. Uh, so in this image, we're seeing some really nuanced color of yellow, green, yellow, and orange uh, all throughout the image. So lastly, we'll talk about warm and cool color. Uh, these are really easy uh, to talk about. So uh, warm color is red, orange, and yellow and variations of those colors. Uh, warm colors are usually intense and we tend to uh, see them advancing in space. So to talk about warm color, I brought up this image uh, called Alarm uh, by Garrett Bomber, made in 2012. And this is from our Midwest Photographers Project. Uh, you'll notice that this image is dominated by the color red, which is a warm color. In this series uh, called Restricted Access, uh, Garrett creates imagined scenarios in which the elaborate emergency systems that are created to protect and secure humans ultimately fail. And he fabricates these uh, using uh, 3D sets and he highlights the features of infrastructure that are designed for security. Uh, the models become stages for the theater of human anxiety and fear and the aftermath of a tragic uh, or unforeseen event. And I think that's a great way to think about um, his use of color here. So let's open up just real quick uh, a question. Do you feel like the use of color red works well with this image and the word alarm? And if so, why? Or generally, how does the color red make you feel in this image? Anyone have any uh, responses to how this color makes them feel? Anxious, uneasy, emergency, right? Yeah, alarms, alert. Those are all really awesome words. I think that, you know, it may get down into something subconscious, but also culturally, I think we associate red with all these words, thinking about, um, you know, alarm, like we, we literally see alarm lights that will go off. Um, we also think about like a stop sign, right, or a, a red light, uh, things that often cause alarm or at least alertness. Uh, but red could also um, cause you to feel passion. Uh, it also can talk about, um, you know, love. We associate red with love because, I mean, think about marketing during Valentine's Day. Um, red is often used to, to, to illustrate a lot of these ideas. Okay, well, thank you all for those responses. It's great to see so many words coming in. So uh, just to wrap up warm, uh, you'll see that on the color wheel, you could basically divide it in half and one side of that color wheel will be warm and then the other side of that color wheel will be cool. Which brings us to cool color. So cool colors are typified by blue, green, and light purple. Uh, cool colors are not overpowering and they tend to recede into space. So the opposite of warm colors. I love this image by Alex Soth. Um, it's one of my favorite photographers. And this is such a beautiful example of cool color. So this image is Charles Lindbergh's boyhood bed from Little Falls, Minnesota. And this was made in 1999. I mean, just look at those really beautiful cool colors all throughout the photograph. So Soth creates color photographs um, of scenes and people that he discovers along the Mississippi River in this case. Uh, this project is called uh, Sleeping Along the Mississippi. And uh, he begins the voyage in the frozen winters of Minneapolis and ends all the way in the hot, sultry climate of New Orleans. His pictures trace a uh, cultural gradation along the largest and most storied rivers in the United States. And he allows his body and mind to wander along the river uh, creating a series of lyrical images that capture the spirit of the region. Seeing the chat box light up here. Yes, absolutely. This, um, this, this chat, this is all being recorded and you can watch it later. So uh, just like the warm image, uh, let's pause for a moment and reflect on how cool color or this color blue affects us. How, do, how does this image make you feel in regards to color? cold, restful, lonely, quiet, calm, 
spacious, peaceful, comfortable. Man, so many great words. Yeah, really, really cool. Yeah, thank you for those words. I think that's, that's all very accurate. So this is our last um, color scheme that we'll talk about. And just to, to review here, the cool color is gonna be located on this side of the color wheel. And we're predominantly looking at uh, different shades of blue here. So uh, the last technical thing that we'll go over is color contrast. Um, these, some of these can sound a bit intimidating, but it's actually really simple. We won't go too deep into each of these in the interest of time, uh, but I will try to point out a few photographs later in the presentation that use these strategies. Uh, so Iden was one of the first people to define uh, and identify strategies for successful color combinations. And so he, he devised these seven methods for coordinating color. And those seven are the contest, contrast of hue, light and dark, cool and warm, complementary, simultaneous, contrast of saturation and contrast of extension. So each one is, is actually fairly simple. So contrast of hue, basically all that means is that you have more than three colors present in the image. Uh, when we see multiple colors together, it's, uh, it's, it just kind of flickers and, and we really just get this overwhelming sense of vibrance. And so that creates a, a nice contrast. Light and dark, very simple, right? It goes right back to that uh, contrast that we all know of white and dark. Uh, typically, we think about white and black as being uh, the, the strongest contrast, but we also see it in color as well. Uh, so the difference between the level of brilliance or illumination within a color can create that light and dark contrast. Then we have complementary, which we basically already covered. That just means the contrast between complementary colors. So orange and blue are going to create a really nice contrast. Simultaneous is what we started with, with the deep seeing exercise. And this is actually something that exists within a lot of art, but it can't quite be photographed. So it's a bit unique to our medium. Simultaneous contrast is, again, that idea that our eye is trying to simultaneously produce the contrasting uh, complementary color to the color that we're looking at. So that one, again, can't be photographed, but it's interesting to know about. And then contrast of saturation, uh, which if you're not familiar with saturation, that just basically means the, the dullness or vividness of a color. Um, so it, this relates to the degree of the purity of the color. Um, so it's a contrast between pure, intense colors and dull, diluted colors. So even uh, just having different shades or different versions of green is going to create contrast contrast if one version of that green is dull and then the other version of that green is very vivid and pure. And then the very last one before we move on is contrast of extension. This is a, again a, a big phrase that means something very simple. Uh, the contrast of extension is the relative size of the color or in how it's distributed. So if you can imagine um, Yes, yeah, so the, the question, the example of simultaneous contrast. Uh, if you saw the very beginning of the lecture where we looked at the blue slide, our eyes were trying to produce the orange. Uh, so that's kind of more of a physiological thing and not something that you'll see inside of a, a photograph. But then Jonathan said James Terrell's light installations are, are really great. And I, I would agree, I think that's probably one of the best examples because he's using physical light to create that art. And then so uh, back to the contrast of extension, uh, basically all that means is that there is relative size of the color within the image. So if you have a photograph that has a little bit of yellow, but then a lot of blue, the contrast is that there's a small amount of yellow and a large amount of blue. So not that difficult. Someone's asking about beige and brown and which category do they belong? So I would say, yeah, definitely that's probably tertiary, but then also um, browns uh, and, and colors similar to browns are darker colors uh, of orange and red. So the, uh, you can uh, tint and shade orange and red down to a point uh, that it becomes brown. And then it also it depends on what medium that you're working with, because mixing paint versus mixing light is going to be a totally different story. Uh, if we had a lot longer time to get into that in this, uh, I would love to go over the difference between light and printing and pigment and paint, but uh, we're going to keep it fairly condensed uh, for this presentation. 
So that concludes the, the technical bit of the presentation. And now we're going to go on to just talking about color photographs that we have inside of our collection that do really cool things with color. Um, to get started, I would like to talk about this piece called Above This Earth's Games Games from 1968. Uh, this is by Ralph Arnold. And it's a multimedia piece that has a really interesting combination of painted color and clippings of color photographs. A lot of uh, chronological contemporary photography surveys of color photos would probably jump straight to William Eggleston. Uh, but I would want to, I just wanted to bring this up. I think it's appropriate to acknowledge that there are many different artists uh, who are working with color photography as well as color and photography. Uh, long before some of the art, uh, the gatekeepers in the art world decided that color photography could be art. Um, so I just wanted to kind of remind everyone that there's so many different artists that have used color in interesting ways before the 1970s. And one of those people is Ralph Arnold. Uh, so Ralph Arnold was an artist and educator uh, based in the south side of Chicago. And he works on collage, painting, and text pieces that had a dedication to addressing um, issues of race and gender and identity. And he drew upon his own identity to fuel uh, this extraordinary creative output. So uh, he participated in some of the most provocative exhibitions during the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, by the 1980s, he became more focused on his teaching and uh, just being engaged within the art community. But I really love this piece. And you'll see that it's actually gone on to inspire uh, more art uh, that we'll cover in this lecture. So now we'll talk about Eggleston, which is, uh, like I was saying, pretty much the go-to when we talk about color photography. And the reason that that is, is because before the 1970s, although we had color film starting in the 1930s, color photography was not widely accepted in the art world. Uh, there was this basically um, group of people like William Eggleston that was part of a, a rising generation that embraced color and overturned this long-standing notion that it was a low-brow medium. Up to that point, it was uh, color photography was strongly associated with advertising and photojournalism, and the myth persisted that only black and white photographs could achieve the quality of art. Uh, so eventually, uh, there was a coming of age, so to speak, of color photography in the 1970s, and this is partially due to a museum curator named John Sarkowski, who was the director of photography at the MoMA in New York from 1962 to 1961. And while uh, John Sarkowski was the director, he had an exhibition of Eggleston's color photographs, and that was in 1976. And this exhibition went on to reframe the idea of color photography in the art world and opening up a whole new generation of people to work with color. Honestly, my own personal um, thought on this is I think it's a little bit silly uh, for a group of people to decide that color is or is not art uh, when so many people were using color in their photography and creating wonderful pieces of art before that. But that just kind of shows you a little, a look into the how the art world functions sometimes. Um, sometimes you have a group of people that kind of really steer uh, what we all uh, look at and decide is art. Uh, so if you know anything about Eggleston's process, he used a dye printing, uh, dye transfer printing process, which is really interesting. It's a really technical phrase that basically means that he used layers of dye pigment to create his photographs, which are really stunning to look at. So when you get the opportunity to see his work in person, you should definitely do that. Uh, the experience is unique is because when you look at the, the artwork, you can kind of see this really deep layering that happens uh, with the color. It's really beautiful. Um, looking at this photograph, uh, which is titled, untitled, uh, room with old TV lamps and wildwood, you'll notice that Eggleston was drawn to pretty banal subject matter. Uh, I mean, this is everything between um, like the inside of a freezer to a light bulb on a ceiling. Um, he really just enjoyed the ability of photography to take these kind of mundane moments and transform them into uh, really interesting compositions using color and lighting. And that was a dye pigment transfer process. I saw that question there. 
looking at this image, uh, just to point out a couple details, like you may think, well, you know, this is kind of uninteresting. It's just the inside of a room. You know, what's really going on here? But if you look closely, there are some pretty adept uses of color uh, and also repetition. So in the background through the window, we can kind of see this pink or magenta awning on this, on this building. And then we can see that repeated here in the lamp. And then we also see this kind of orange brass color repeated uh, again through here the window. We have the blue surrounding, we have these two red chairs, and then someone already pointed out the hula hoops. Um, that's pretty great too, right? Like we can see this complementary color palette happening just in this small section of the image. Uh, so don't write off William Eggleston, even if you don't find his images the most beautiful thing you've ever looked at. Uh, just take some time to reflect on the color and how he's using that to create an interesting composition. So now we're going to move on to one of my personal favorites. Um, this is the architectural site number 17, uh, the High Museum by Barbara Caston, made in 1988. Uh, Barbara was influenced by the Bauhaus and constructivism. Uh, she explores modes of reorganizing the visual environment. Uh, so she employs geometric shapes, mirrors, glass, lighting gels, and a lighting crew that she recruited from the film industry. And she, with these materials, she creates an abstract interpretation of interior spaces and architectural details. So we can see clearly in this image that Kasten is using super saturated color and dramatic juxtapositions of line and angle and form. And it really creates this just beautiful uh, image in the end. So Kasten, uh, just to point out, uh, was born in 1936 in Chicago. And she is the recipient of many prestigious awards. Uh, her work has been widely exhibited by major museums in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan. Uh, her photographs are in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, the uh, International Center of Photography in New York, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the, the MoMA in New York, and also the Museum of Modern Art in Poland, as well as the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, Kasten was a previous professor of photography at Columbia College Chicago. So she's one of our own. Uh, we're very uh, proud to have her as part of our Columbia family. Uh, she actually was here last year to do a lecture in photography and it was really incredible. Let me tell you, she's an absolute rock star. Uh, you should check out her work. Definitely will forever be remembered in the history of color photography. So now let's talk about this image, which is excerpt from 8,146,774 suns from Flickr, made by Penelope Umbrico in 2010. This is a really great example of what we were talking about earlier, um, the contrast of hue, because we can clearly see way more than three colors being used in this image. Uh, isn't it dazzling to see so many colors at once? It's really, really great. Uh, so in this image, we see numerous pictures that the artist Penelope Umbrico found on a image sharing website called Flickr. Uh, so she found these images by searching for one of the most popular search terms, which was sunset. The title references the number of results that she received from the day that she did the search and made the work. The first version was created in 2007, and the search result produced 2,303,057 images of sunsets on that first try. And then three years later, uh, on 2010, that search result was up to 7,626,056 images. Uh, so Umbrico crops these files, uh, she's appropriating them, she crops them, and then she prints them in a four by six image uh, that is printed by a Kodak EasyShare uh, printer, which is really similar uh, to thinking about the days when we used to go to Walgreens to that one hour photo processing uh, to get that small little four by six print. So the, she then clusters all these prints into an enormous array and installation of sunsets that underscores our universal human attraction to the sun. I think that all of us here on this meeting are guilty of opening up our cell phones and taking a thousand photos of a sunset that we just found profoundly beautiful. I think it's something that we all clearly do to, to get that huge amount of search results on Flickr. I also love thinking about this piece because in 2010, you know, 
Umbrico is probably reflecting on this loss of an analog process because um, we don't really see very many one hour photo processing places, right? Like we've pretty much all moved to digital or these the online resources to print our photography. We don't really see those machines anymore. But now just 10 years later in 2020, Flickr, that website is now also obsolete. It's, it's, now, uh, it's now not in operation in the way that it was in 2010. So there's kind of multiple layers of thinking about how color photographs are produced and represented in our culture. And it's, it's always constantly changing. And Penelope is always thinking about these changes. All right, so let's move on to this image. This is Nick in his old room by Lisa Linvey, made in 2007. Uh, Linvey makes some really beautiful work. Um, this is an ongoing series that takes a really personal look into the daily lives of her family members as they grapple with the effects of uh, her mother's mental illness. And so though we never actually see Lisa's mother, her influence is felt by her family members in the spaces that they inhabit. Uh, Photographed over the last five years, uh, the disheveled appearance of her father, her sister, and her brothers is mirrored uh, by the unkept and chaotic experience and appearance of uh, their home. These scenes show a literal deterioration of their home life while also serving as a metaphor for their mother's declining health. This, uh, this project is really powerful, uh, obviously emotionally for many different reasons, but Lisa also uses color in a really uh, elegant way. So if you notice in this image, the, the red carpet next to these blue bottles underneath the bed, and then also the blue jeans, and then the background, which is a, a kind of a desaturated yellow, create a primary color palette. So that red, blue, and yellow again. It's a really wonderful work. I would encourage you to look at her full project. Uh, she has some really, really wonderful uses of color. The one that sticks out in my mind is there's a line of these really brightly colored soda bottles uh, and they're in line like the like in the rainbow, the Roy G. Biv style. And uh, it's really just a vivid, awesome image. So then I wanted to talk about this image uh, holding. Uh, this is by uh, artist Berth Biontech. Uh, this is in 2015. Uh, when you look at her work, you'll notice that portraiture is really at the foundation of all of it. Um, all of her subjects are usually shot alone and resulting in images that convey a sense of isolation or sometimes loneliness. Um, she's really frank about being inspired by David Lynch, specifically his TV series Twin Peaks. And like Lynch, uh, she demonstrates a preference for portraying people in dramatic lighting, and she's also uh, trying to give the composition a sense of eeriness. Her subjects usually are uh, well-worn and express a contemplative facial expression, and their clothing and makeup are sometimes bizarre or ill-fitting. Her color, uh, her use of color is really subtle, but really beautiful. I just love uh, the color that's happening in this image. It's, it's really subtle. I like that the, the desaturated green in the background kind of goes well with this a desaturated orange and peach color. Really beautiful stuff. So then I wanted to talk about Blind Massage by Guan Yu Hu. Uh, so this artist recently graduated from uh, the School of the Art Institute here in Chicago. And if you've been going to any art fairs or keeping up with uh, contemporary photography, this artist has really been exploding and uh, getting a lot of notability. Um, I love this image just because it's such a great use of complementary color. Uh, we have this kind of red orange with this overall blue green in the background, and then it all ties nicely together with the purple towel across the man in the middle. Uh, so Guan Yu makes a lot of uh, work. He's very proactive, and uh, most of the series deals with domestic spaces and then also contemplating his own sexual identity. And he does this one series where when his parents leave their apartment, uh, he puts up images and photographs and posters and material all over the apartment, really constructing an interesting space and then removing it all before his parents come home. It's a really, really cool series, uh, great use of color. So definitely check out that artist as well. 
So I actually believe we have this artist with us today. Did I see that correctly? Barbara, are you here with us? Okay, I thought I saw her name earlier, but we're looking at Red Room Floor Four by Number Three, uh, number three by Barbara Grant. Uh, this was made in 2013. So Barbara is primarily a commercial photographer, um, but she's been photographing architecture for over 25 years. Her Project 820 Ebony Jet uh, series documents the historic building that once housed the landmark African-American owned Johnson Publishing Company. Uh, and this building was ready to undergo uh, reconstruction uh, in the former JPC building on 820 South Michigan, uh, what had been completely emptied of all of its contents. And Karant's uh, photographs capture the remaining textures and the colors and the structures that were left over from this workspace that had been in operation for over 40 years. Uh, the absence of all these personal uh, artifacts don't really hinder the unique feeling of the space because we get to reflect on the occupancy and the culture that shaped it for so many decades. Um, Karant's documentary photographs of this space really uh, emphasize and celebrate the narrative of that story in history. I also just wanted to bring up here a couple online. We don't actually have these in our collection. It's definitely something we should think about, but uh, I just wanted to bring up this to, so you can see a little bit of the color palettes that were used as well as placing it into the context of history. Um, there have been many artists that have drawn inspiration from these magazines, and we're actually going to take a look at two more uh, in just a moment that draw inspiration from both the color palette and the content. So we see on the left, Ebony Magazine from 1961 in November. In the middle, we have the one from June 1961. And then on the right, we have Jet Magazine from April 1976. So this image, uh, 73 by Diana Moore, it's made in 2018. And uh, this is actually a painting. It's one of our only paintings in our collection, but you can see that it still uses photographic elements. Um, Moore created this specifically for a recent exhibition that we had called The Many Hats of Ralph Arnold, Art, Identity, and Politics where Moore was directly responding to the work of Ralph Arnold. And if you remember, that was the first artist that we had on our slides. So in this work titled 73, uh, which is the year of Ayanna Moore's birth, uh, she embeds an image from an advertisement for a hair product that she clipped out of the 1973 issue of Ebony Magazine. Using the geometric hard-edged abstraction favored by Ralph Arnold, she creates a triangular pattern uh, that is richly hued with colors that evoke the pan-African design identity of the Black Liberation Movement from the 1960s. And those colors were red, black, and green. So we can see that throughout the work. And you can see how just these subtle color palettes are evoking a very specific history. The choice of the hair product advertisement is subtly invoking uh, the questions of dominant beauty narratives in our culture. Uh, and specifically the pressure for black women and men to assimilate to white beauty standards that were so predominant at this time and still today, to be frank. Um, like Arnold, Moore probes the links between consumer culture, race, media, and society. It's a really, really beautiful piece and it's interesting to see in person. Um, I believe this is the piece, there's actually, um, you can't quite see it in this documentation, but there's a flag that sticks off of the corner, which is really cool. Another artist that was uh, heavily inspired by Ebony and Jet magazine and the colors that were found inside is Nakia Brown. Uh, so this image, Satin Pillow, uh, made in 2015, is responding to some of that. And uh, this series comes, uh, the name of this series is If Nostalgia Were Colored Brown. Uh, she made it in 2013, and she's considering the role that hair plays in relation to societal expectations of race and gender. Her still life pictures portray beauty products. Uh, sometimes you'll see curlers, domed hair dryers, head wraps, and relaxing creams alongside vintage album covers and candy colored pastel backdrops. Uh, the images contemplate political implications of natural hair while calling into question the dominant white standards of beauty 
in defining contemporary femininity. Really wonderful project. Uh, and this image is actually meant to be seen with two other images, so I've included those as well. So this is self-portrait in shower cap from 2015. Really awesome uh, use of pink, green, and yellow here. And then also Vital Sheen from 2015. Really great work. Um, uh, we love showing this work in our print viewing. So then um, I wanted to include this as well. I know that it's a little awkward to look at a book over the internet, uh, but I just couldn't help myself uh, because I recently saw this work. Uh, we went to uh, Amay's studio recently with the graduate students at Columbia and her studio is absolutely amazing. Um, it's just got material and just uh, color everywhere you look. Um, and she also has such an amazing uh, photo book collection at her home. So I just had to include this. Her work is really amazing with the use of color. And you can see a little bit in this spread of this book from the project with Inger. Uh, this is in collaboration with Jennifer Keats from The Donut Shop, and uh, it was made in 2015. And you'll see that she makes some really perplexing arrangements from fragments of her own photographs, as well as collages of daily life. Um, there are vastly different photographic experiences of nature, the arts, urban environments, and they're all interwoven together uh, to create very specific uh, a very specific singular object. In this way, uh, she's testing the flexibility of photographic representation and using the medium's ability to document, but doing it so to only cite colors, patterns, and spaces. So here's another image that shows one of her spreads. Just a really fascinating project. Seeing a lot of response in the chat. I think we can all agree that Amay is awesome. All right, so now we're gonna talk about this image, Early Spring, The Charming Evening from 2014. This is by artist Wardo Milan. Uh, Milan is known for his inter interdisciplinary artistic practice, uh, typically combining drawing, collage, diorama, and photography. He investigates uh, intertwined personal and political histories. Renowned figures from politics, art history, and pop culture all stand beside family snapshots in his elaborate constructions. Uh, his assemblages provide a very personal take on history and politics of race and sexuality in the United States. And overall, I can just have to say that this particular image is just very surreal and otherworldly. And I would like to just pause again, too, to talk about our response to the color. How does this particular color palette make you feel? Using this bright yellow and like a lime green and magenta, it's very specific. Magical, surreal, jarring. Yeah, those are really good words. Summer, you can see that. Trippy, toxic, psychedelic. Yeah, really specific, right? This is um, really adding this kind of eeriness to the overall image. Awesome. So now we'll move along. I wanted to show this image called Yellow Sweater, Untitled from Hide the Sun by Paul McCartney, made in between 2014 and 2017. I couldn't find the exact date when this image was made, but that's the that's the dates when the project were made. And this is from our Midwest Photographers Project. Um, so McCartney constructs dark still lifes and portraits that feature the color yellow. And the color yellow in this series is a stand-in of sorts for natural sunlight. So most of the work is shot primarily at nighttime with the use of heavy flash. And she presents her subjects with boldly and brightly uh, centered frames with as if almost like an evidence for an unknown disaster. In some images, yellow appears in bouquets of flowers or in the leaves of trees, while others uh, are featuring man-made objects uh, like fabric. Collectively, the series invokes a cinematic eeriness and imagines a world with, without the warmth of the sun's rays. It's a really beautiful project uh, that's been recently made. 
and I would definitely encourage you to check out the full body of work. Did I see that, um, it, are you with us today, Paul? Cool. So now we're gonna move along to a final image. Um, this is called Cozy Corner Lights by Christian Patterson, made in 2004. This photograph comes from the book Sound Effects, uh, which is basically a, a project that consists of photographs of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, which is the birthplace of rock and roll and the home of the blues. So Patterson is attempting to make photographs uh, that work together almost like a melody, the way music would, but made with light. And so it focuses on musical arrangements of color, light, and rhythm, and form exploring music's presence and the musicality of everyday life. Christian Patterson does not deny his photographic background. Uh, this body of work was made between 2002 and 2005 while working with William Eggleston. So if you remember, we started at the beginning talking about Eggleston's huge impact on the history of color photography. And Patterson was fortunate enough to spend three years developing this work while working directly with Eggleston. And I knew that uh, this collaboration had happened uh, when looking at, um, looking at this work, but I never made um, the connection between two specific images until making this presentation. And I just wanted to show that, uh, share that with you now. So if you look here, uh, we have William Eggleston uh, on the left, Greenwood, Mississippi from 1973. And this is an online resource, it's not in our collection, but I just had to show it. Uh, so if you see there, comparing that to Christian Patterson's image, Cozy Corner Lights from 2004, we see really striking similarities. So the subject matter is obviously the light fixture on the ceiling. Uh, we see that in both. Then also the composition of the photograph emphasizes the corner of the room. We can see that in both images. We can see also on the right wall, uh, something hanging here. And in Eggleston's image, these look like either wrestling positions or sexual positions, I'm not quite sure. And then on the right, we have something hanging on the wall as well. But specifically, look at the color. So we have a little bit of yellow in Eggleston's, and then again, a little spot of yellow in Patterson's. And then in Eggleston's, primarily the color palette is red. We see that red here on the ceiling, except Patterson flipped it, and we see a little less red and more blue. I couldn't find anything online that that like really solidified that Patterson was looking at this image when creating his own. But I think it's pretty clear that um, he was very inspired by his time with working with Eggleston. And it's just a little bit too coincidental, I think, on the part of these images to deny that there was this really great collaborative and homage um, experience back to Eggleston himself. So that wraps up um, the slides. I thought that would be a neat way to end uh, the, the slide portion of this because it talks about not only a lineage of some of the beginning use of color in photographic history, but it also uh, brings up the idea that the us today, the image makers today, we're gonna set the standards for how that lineage moves forward. And I hope that the ideas in this lecture um, help you make really compelling images and also just become better viewers of photo uh, color photography in general. So that being said, before I open up to the question and answer portion, I just want to remind everyone that next week, uh, we're gonna have another Photos at Zoom section, um, session called uh, Constructed and Staged Images. This will be led by Kristen Taylor, uh, our Curator of Academic Programs and Collections. Kristen is a wealth of knowledge and I'm really excited to see her take on this content. Uh, so tune in from Wednesday, April 22nd at 12 p.m. Uh, to 1 p.m. and we'll talk about uh, constructing the stage images. And then also next week, uh, we're gonna be doing a behind the lens session with Jay Wolke. Uh, this is gonna be really great. It's basically tying into this color theory lecture today. We're trying to match an artist to the topic that we're discussing and then doing a virtual studio visit with that artist. Uh, so definitely tune in. Uh, just so you know, I wanted to pull up a little bit of information about Jay uh, to encourage you to, to participate. So Jay Wolke
Holocaust, photographs of American Jewish communal life from 1998. Also along the divide, photographs of Dan Ryan Expressway from 2004, among others. Uh, his works have been exhibited internationally and are in the permanent print collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the New York MoMA, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the San Francisco MoMA, among others. His photographs have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Financial Times, Exposure, Fortune, and the Village Voice. Uh, from 1992 to 1999, he was a coordinator of graduate documentary photography at the Institute of Design, which for those that know your history, the Institute of Design was considered to be the new Bauhaus after the Bauhaus in Germany had to close because of Nazi Germany during World War II. So there's this really amazing history and lineage of photography that stems from the Bauhaus that lands right in Chicago, and Jay was a part of that. So please tune in. Um, he's, a, he's currently a professor at Columbia College Chicago, um, and he's one of the most intelligent and generous people that I know. You don't want to miss out hearing from Jay from his studio, so check that out. Uh, so I'm going to leave this image up, and then we are going to open for questions and answers. So at this point, if you have any questions or just comments that you want to make about what you saw during today's lecture, now's the time. Yeah, I definitely agree. Having this chat, being able to drop links and everything is, is really great. Can I talk about the colors in the Arnold piece that we started with? Sure, we can go back to that. Yeah, so this uh, Ralph Arnold piece is really interesting for its color. I think in two different ways. My interpretation is not only are we seeing uh, color photographs that have been clipped out of popular media, and you can kind of see some sports uh, players that would probably have been from the magazine cutting. We also see a military personnel, more military images down here. These are most likely trimmings from uh, popular sources like magazines, but then he's also comparing that to these really bright, vivid colors. Oh, that's really nice to see that these talks are the highlight of your week. That's really nice. I'm glad that it can bring some inspiration during a, a really, really weird time. Thank you, Levi. So I see Levi, uh, you're asking about uh, this relationship between advertising and uh, the color photo history. That's a really interesting question. I can't point you to a, like a very specific article on hand, uh, but I could definitely follow up with that. I did spend some time uh, as an art director in an advertising firm for a couple of years. So I do have some personal experience with that world. Um, often like, Brands are really uh, conscious of color. If you think about it, like when you think about banks and hospitals and any public institution that wants trust, they typically use the color blue. Um, it's been seen in a lot of psychoanalytic surveys that the color blue um, it establishes a sense of trust with people. So you'll see that many brands that deal with either money or health or anything that you need to trust them with, they're gonna be using blue. Also in advertising, like we were talking about with the Sunbeam image, a lot of advertisers in the fast food industry use red and yellow. Uh, yellow is a very manic color. It gets us uh, very excited and it's hard to rest while looking at yellow. Uh, so it creates this quick pace that they hope to instill in their establishments. And then red has been reported to make us hungry. I don't know how true that is, but that's why we see so many fast food restaurants using those colors. That's a good question about how the advertising world kind of plays into all of this. Does anybody have any uh, final questions or comments?
All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It was definitely uh, a lot of fun for me to, to do this. And I hope that it brought some type of inspiration uh, while we're all stuck at home. And I hope to see that all of you take this forward. Thank you, everyone.